The other thing about being outwardly focused is an understanding of your growth expectation. So when I first arrived, while the house was burning in one part of the business, say the paint business, and the staff guys were doing okay, it was like, well, leave us alone. We're doing fine, thanks. So I walked in and said, what's our growth been for last year? And they said, we've grown 3%. Hooray. And I said, 3%. And I said, yes, hooray, leave me alone. I said, are we in a building boom? Oh yes, we're in a building boom, we've grown 3%. I said, you should be ashamed of yourself. He said, what do you mean? He said, in the building boom, you should go 20, not three. 3% three is what you grow by putting a price increase through. It's not growth, it's lazy. So I, unfortunately, was the bearer of bad news for everyone. Even those people who thought they were doing so well, I said, you failed. Our best performing state, believe it or not, was Adelaide. How can sleepy Adelaide be the best performing state? Yeah. They were making good profit. There's nothing wrong with what the gentleman was doing in Adelaide. Except he also had an expectation that because he was doing well, we'd leave him alone. I said, Luke, this gentleman named said, Luke, I think you've done well. I'll give you a five out of 10. We went, what? Five out of 10? I said, yes, five out of 10. This was in the last three years. How much have you grown? Oh, it's been about three million, thereabouts. So three million. So that's terrible. So fail for growth. Your profits were good, tick, you get a task for profit. What's your health and safety record like? Oh, well, you know, boys will be boys, you know, building sites. You go, no, fail. So at the moment, then all of a sudden he has a realisation that says, well, actually, that's a real part of the company. Our shareholders expect the return. If you want three million and you go 3%, who's in finance? What's 3% of three million? 60 grand? No, 90,000. 90,000? 90, 90, I said, what can I buy for $90,000? Can I employ new people? Can I buy a new truck? Do you want more equipment? What am I going to do with 3%? Can't do anything. So I said, it's a fail. No, oh, I thought I'd do so well. <laughs> but this is the realisation. You start looking outwardly into the organisation or outwardly into the marketplace. What are we doing? How do we compare against the competitors? Are we satisfying our customers? And this was the challenge I had at Alfield three years ago. So it's been a complete mind shift change for everyone, for everyone, even in, even in terms of what sort of work they were doing. You know, branch managers, if I said to a branch manager, you know, how do you spend your day? He said, I spend my day organising the guys and organising trucks and organising labour. I said, what are your operations guys doing? Oh, I'm helping them. And you go, no, either I get them to do it and you do something else or you become the operations manager. So division of responsibility, it was about being able to understand what role, who adds value. When you come to work today, who's outwardly looking and who's inwardly looking? Who's actively growing your revenue? Who's running your business for you? And giving people accountability and responsibility. So for me, once you define that, and you know your expectation, you can chase. Because what we didn't have is scalability. We had a very consistent business in SCAF that wasn't scalable. That revenue I gave you of three million, was oh, my reconciliation was, it was about the number of one person could run on their own with a few guys. If you want scalability, you can't have that. You have to have systems and processes and understanding and all the other things that go with running an organization. So we had to bring in processes and systems. We had to bring in scalability. And so it's been a, almost a complete transformation of the way people think. It's been a complete transformation of the way we consider the market and how we consider ourselves in the market and how, how our opposition sees us as well. Because in a lot of cases, they thought we were gone. I thought you guys were gone, bro. You're still making bank rock the air, we are. So our two divisions, as we sit here now, are making a complete resurgence of where they, where, where they had fallen away. Okay, so, so we have been literally trying to rebuild it. What's good, what the good news is, is that through all the work we've done and through some of the, you know, being outwardly looking, it's attracted people from outside the organisation to want to look into our organisation. And they say, actually, what you've actually got is really good, but you've been underfunded. And so now we're in a position where after 103 years and 10 years of torture, we're about to turn the whole thing on its head. So, you know, my dream for our business is that we will be in, in four or five countries in the revenue versus one. And for three and a half years ago, we were in one country struggling to survive. But very shortly, we'll have revenue 
from, we've got revenue from Japan, we've got we revenue from China, that started about six or eight months ago. We have the revenue from the UK, we just started online. So with nothing, how do you market? Instagram, you guys all know Instagram, I'm sure. Okay? So I employed a marketing manager. I couldn't afford a marketing manager when I first arrived. So the marketing manager I, I employed was a social media marketer, not a traditional marketer. So we start talking to people on Instagram. So it's about, again, being externally focused, being outwardly focused. Let's put the product in the hands of people that can be the most influential. So here's a funny story. We're talking to a painter in Scotland. And he says, oh, I've never had an Australian brush before. We say, great, we'll send you some. It costs us $20. So we send brushes to Scotland. He says, these are fantastic. You should give some to my mate. So we send some brushes to his mate. You should send, and his mate's in Leicester in England. And he says, these are great. These are the best brushes I've ever used. I said, we know, we've researched that we've, we've, done, we've produced a great product. You should talk this online supply called mypaintbrush.uk. So send us some samples. So we sent them some. And then they said, let's do a trial. Just send like two boxes. We said, sure, we'll send you two boxes. However, They've tested the brush. They think it's the best brush they've ever used. Their main supplier lets them down. I get a phone call. I want a whole container for you. The opening order was 30,000 pounds, not two boxes. We're away in the UK. So that's how we've done it with nothing, with zero resources. And so now we're, we're on the precipice of taking that to a whole new level because all that feedback, New Zealand, the UK, China, etc have got external people involved and they want to invest in our business now. How has that manifested itself? About three weeks ago, we became debt free for the first time in 30 years, no debt. Well, the new investor paid it all out. Okay, we're about to have cash surplus for the first time in 20 years. We can invest in people, we can invest in more R&D, we can invest in good product management. We can really take the next step. We've also engaged a new board. We've also got a completely Chinese speaking board member we have a truly international board. So, I'm an Aussie Maltese, we've got an Aussie Chinese, we've got a full Chinese, we've got <laughs> someone who's a, a Jewish immigrant. The whole board is completely multicultural. And that's where I believe the future of biofuels will be. It will be in Australia for sure, but it will be revenue from half the world. And the, and the, the new board wasn't designed necessarily that way. But the connection I have with the board, of, we've developed a board that is purely international. And so we're about to have scaffolding in Henan province in China. And I'm not sure if you know what Henan province is, but and I'm sorry if I've said that incorrectly, my Chinese pronunciation is terrible. But they've got a small population of 120 million people. So we think we can grow a little bit. And our director, who comes from that province, is the chair of the Australia-China Business Council. I reckon we've got a good chance of growing in China. So <coughs> what's this space? Well, I think there's a lot to do for us. I hope I've answered all your questions. I don't really know. Um, I, think I think I've answered most of them. It's a transformation story. It really is a story about a business that was really um, on its knees, absolutely on its knees, struggling for cash flow. We're still, cash flow isn't great at the moment either, to be honest, but we're about to change that completely. But it's about seeing what's the essence of a business and trying to build on the essence of that business and trying to do it in a way which is creative. It doesn't necessarily, you don't need to have a million dollars for a marketing uh, campaign, you can do it on Instagram if you're, if you're smart enough. But it's about seeing the opportunities that will add the most value. And I think I'm a huge believer in coming to work and, and choosing those tasks that add the most value and that's the philosophy of trying to get through all of my people. The downside of some of this, and we're a 100 year old company, is that I've changed every manager on the East Coast in the last three years. Some people want to get into the journey, some people can't find it hard to get and join the journey. But unfortunately, when you're in a rhythm like that, and I've, again, for me, it's always train, motivate, cajole, assist. But there comes a point where you go, I'm going on a journey, and if you don't want to come, then you have to get off the bus. And so, as I said, there's not one branch manager on the East Coast who's the same branch manager that was three years ago. Um, so it takes an attitude change and a cultural change. That's not to say that some others haven't come on the journey, that is true. My friend in Adelaide, Mr. Free Me in Adelaide, 
he's uh, still there and he's growing, he will be five or six million this year. So he's really grown. Okay, so he's hanging there, he's a great guy, but he's the sort of guy where you have to tell him and he'll fight with you and he'll go and think about it and go, no, you should do that. And then off he goes. Alright, so but so that some people have survived. But the challenge was to try and get a business to regrow. And sometimes when you have to save the hole, you have to chop a few arms and legs off before you can get to the hole. Okay? Our poor old shareholders haven't had a dividend in 15 years. I'm hoping next year we'll pay them the first dividend in 15 years. That'd be nice. Get some rewards for your patients. Our share price is going up uh, at the moment, which is nice. It's not anywhere near where it needs to be, but just the expectation where we want to go and the ideas that we're presenting forward, people are buying into the company, even though we haven't got the results just yet. So just that philosophical turnaround and the, and the opportunity to present real opportunity means that we're moving again. So it's work in progress. So um, three years out of 103, let's see what the next three years uh, will, put, will deliver. But I guarantee, even in 12 months, we will not be the same business that we are today. No way in the world. No way. We'll be different. In two years' time, we'll be different again. And in three years' time, we'll be different again. So thanks for, thanks for listening. Um, I hope that was an interesting story. Um, and I hope that we can keep delivering this growth that we can do on you. We'll see. It's a challenge. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions if, if people have questions. Or... On that, yeah, I, said, uh, I sort of wrote down on the start and said, um, Old Fields is basically given a bunch of things about offering a premium product. Yeah. So I so for me it's about taking market share back so for me it's a deliberate strategy to take market share back i could have the best brush and we get to this at a premium price but i've now got to convince the painter to break these old habits so and i'm tired of hearing that 20 years ago you have we only fucked off but so now you've got to sleep and we put somebody else in so the whole strat that's a deliberate strategy. The deliberate strategy is to say, so let's take for example our new brush in the marketplace. It's no secret, it's the Pro Series brush. The opposition runs about twenty-three dollars. So I said to my team, I want to be nineteen ninety-nine at retail value. So they're psychologically below the best, what they perceive to be the best. Okay, but I want to, I want a compelling reason why they should use it. So so they'd be right. Why would I sell a premium product for less than what the opposition does? Because I want the market share. We're short cash, we're short profit. So at the moment, I've restructured the whole balance sheet and profit and loss so that when we sell a product, we make money. That's another thing I didn't talk about. Now I know that every product we sell, we make a profit. And I'm not interested in being Mila in, in the fridge space that sells fridges for three grand. We'll get there one day, but right now, I've got to save the company today. And the way to save the company today is to get the market share back. We know we're making good money, so I'm not precious. I don't care if we're not 25 instead of 23, I'll be 19. Probably 17, uh, but I want the market share because what we have is what we need now is volume. Okay, so I know if every brush I sell, I'll probably make eight dollars, and I need to sell lots and lots and lots of them. But I've got to, I've got to irritate the opposition. That's the fun part of it. It's irritating the opposition. Yeah, I don't, I don't plan to put the price up. I plan to go to England and then America and then Japan. So you know the market share piece I talked about? I don't want market share in Australia, I want market share all over the world. And so I want to deal with the price down. So if we're $19 today, I'd like to be $17 or $16, but in four countries, because volume gives you buy bargaining power. And so for me, this is one step out of 100 to become not only an Australian provider, now, I've, I've lived through, I'm older than all of you, um, and I've lived through a number of cycles, okay? So one of the things I'm trying to get to our business is what I call countercyclical revenue streams. What revenue streams can we build that beat the building cycle, okay? And part of that for me is going offshore, okay? So I've worked, in, I've worked for Borrell, if you check my LinkedIn profile, I've worked for Borrell, and I was there before 2000. Um, I said before some of you were probably born, 
and we had a boom. How do I future-proof the business? There's a number of things. One, can see pull revenue streams in different channels. Two, a, geogra a geographic strategy that takes that risk away. Being, being in channels that are counter-cyclical means that we've been building in one, maintenance in another, shutdown work in another, and other. So it's about being able to walk and chew gum, being, developing specialties that will take you there. So to your question about price, I want to keep the pressure on the opposition. I want to knock them out, okay? I'm a very competitive individual, and if, if they're coming to me struggling, they'll be good. Okay? So what I want to do is take their market share and then take their market share overseas. Because for me, the way I want to do it is I want to turn our $30 million business into $150 million and then beyond that. And so for me, it's about conquer Australia, get our position up shore up, put a moat around our business so we're profitable, but then start pulling feelers out. And the only way you can do that is to, have to, to convince yourself and the, and the customers that you have the best price in the market. Try and get scale so you get a reduction in price and volume. Um, and then try and penetrate those markets through whatever means you can. Now luckily for us now, well, not likely, but for all the hard work, we're going to have some investors that are prepared to back it. And so I had a conversation with our new major shareholder only last week, and he was, we were talking about a brand new product. He said, how much capital do you need? Now, just so you know, in the last three years, I've never had that conversation. We've had no capital. Right. I finally got a chairman that says, how much money do you want to go? What, what do you think the opportunity would be? And I said, for argument's sake, I've invested in five million. If I'm going to need a million, let's get it started. But five million break to 10. And he said, do it. Didn't even hesitate. I thought, oh, that's a refreshing uh, approach. So for me, this is this is a multi-stage strategy. This is about getting our position right, taking the market share, using volume, and then expanding there. I hope that answers your question. What is your current market share compared to Stella? Uh, okay, so in, in, in paint products, I think we're probably about 15%. Okay, in scaffolding, we're probably 10. So there's plenty of upside. And so when people say to us, oh, the building is hurting us, I said, unless you've got 90% market share, I don't talk to you. Okay. So we're, we're in a position where, unfortunately, because of the situation we're in, and because we were inwardly focused, we've got our, position, our business in a sustainable position at the revenue where we're at. Can we be significantly greater? Absolutely. And the way you do that is to be outwardly looking, to understand how big the market size is. You know, so I always love this conversation with, with, with some of our guys. Because we should be maintenance. And I said, boss, we do maintenance. Do you work for people like Spotless or Board Spectrum or one of those? Do you, oh yes, yes, we do all their work. I say, all their work? And they go, yeah, absolutely. How much work do you do from people like Spotless? Oh, we do 30 grand a month. I said, that's fantastic. You know how big Spotless are? Well, I'm not pretty sure. Their turnovers are like a billion dollars. But you don't do all their work. You go into nothing, none of that. So it's about understanding your market, understanding your customer. I suspect what their answer is, we do all the work for one supervisor with Spotless. But there's 400 supervisors. So it's about taking that market share understanding, developing that and saying, how do we scale up? We've talked about scalability before, okay? How do we scale up to not one channel, but four channels? I worked for the Bonds business a long time ago. People might know Bonds. Bonds is a clothing brand in Australia. And one of my best teachers was a CEO I worked for at the time, a lady called Sue Morford. Fantastic, you know, brilliant lady. And um, what we did at that time was develop one product and then another and then another and another. We were famous for one product at that time. It was a, the men's singlet. Um, it was you know, a pretty basic product. But what she was a master at was keeping that branch going and then another channel, which was women's underwear. And then it was girls' t-shirts. And then it was men's t-shirts. So we, we developed multi-channels. So my, I'd like to think I'm a genius in this, but I'm not. I'm just pinching ideas for people I've worked for in the past. But that multi-channel strategy was exactly out of Supermarket's copy book. Bonds went from $140 million to $250 million in four years. I want to do the same in our business. But you can apply that logic into any business in terms of how you want to approach it. So that channel strategy for me works because it does a number of things. A, it increases your expertise. B, it allows you to have multiple revenue streams that are counter cyclical. It allows you to look at multiple channels that are, are all peaking at a different time. If I can have a business that's peaking at different times and also in different geographies, I'll be a, running a public company that tries to show some consistent growth. Because if one of them's down, I'll go, you know what, that's terrible, but I've got four other revenue streams. Otherwise, you just buy in a ditch when it comes down. That was my borrow experience. It's like, okay, let's get rid of half the guys in the yard, let's get rid of half the sales reps. So that's what we're doing now. We're developing that multi-channel thing. But the market share part, you ask, is a very valid question. 
if you don't know it, how do you know what you're chasing? How do you know what you're chasing? It's really, really important. So I've let the outside in. It might sound like a strange word. You know, I've said to our management team, imagine that you open the window of the office and have all of our shareholders standing at the grandstand looking into this room. But do you think they'd want us to decide to do the same as before and, and have no growth? I reckon they're sitting at the window waiting for us to make a decision. So when you look at market share, when you look at those other things, what are we going to do differently so that the next year's result is different to this year's result? Because if we don't do that, we're letting them down. Their money, not ours. They're, they pay our wages. We're just the custodians in this period of time. So we have to know market share, we have to chase it, and we have to try and be very specific about the strategy we do. The mistake of my predecessors is they thought, great, and my market share goal will be to buy a different business, and it blew up, okay? My goal is to take our existing core business and have what, what product adjacencies. So I'm not gonna go out and buy a smelling salt business, it's not what we do. Unfortunately, my predecessors bought businesses like that. They bought really weird product businesses that we had no expertise in. Okay. What I'm talking about is developing the core expertise, and then going left and right, left and right, left and right, and then going geography. Okay? You don't, I don't have to become a donut producer. I don't, I've made paintbrush, I'm not a donut, so I'm not gonna buy a donut business. But what I am gonna do, is I'm gonna become a paint expert around the world. I'm gonna become a scaffold business around the world. And then what I'm gonna do is buy a root veg protection business. And then I'm gonna buy another business that might suit the painting industry. It might buy a uniform business but they'll be left and right. If you think about some of the best strategies in the world, take Nike, for example, others, that's exactly what they did. They start with shoes, and then they go tennis rackets, and then they go something else, they go left and right of their core. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're going left and right of our core, and go across, and then grow geographically. So there has been cases when they have to So you're right, Nike may have said, you know what, we don't, it may have been an underperforming part of their business, and so they want to feed the strong, not the weak. But they feed the strong divisions, not the weak divisions. Absolutely. I, I then made a perception about them that they want to invest in, in, the, in whatever they're doing. They want to invest in the market. So if their product was not doing very well, I mean, it was one of yeah. three numbers, but not the best. So uh, absolutely. The to it. Absolutely. So, so it after, nothing happens. Your, your analysis is perfect. Um, I want the same. I want to be number one or two. I don't want to be three or four. It's too hard. I want to be number one, right? Now, number one takes a long time to get there, okay? So, number one for me is where do you start being number one? You can't just sell help or market you're not going to get it. The best place to start, and Nike did the same thing, is you can't start with poor product. You start with poor product, people are going to work you out in about 10 minutes. So the only place to start for me is great product, okay? Once you have great product, but then it's great service. There's no, there's no point having great product if people can't get it. So I've said to my warehouse team, in before two, out the same day. They went, you're crazy. I said, no. If a paint, painters aren't necessarily scientific people, I don't mean to disrespect me if you're a painter, but they want run out of paint brushes this afternoon, they want it tomorrow. So we, we developed a service standard, a service standard across the entire business. And so the most simplistic one is exactly that. In before two, out the same day. So we say to our customers, if you place an on before two o'clock, Next morning, it's on your doorstep. So start with great product, then have great service. You start eliminating the reasons why you can't be number two or number, four, number one, okay? Then it gets harder after that. Then you've got to convince customers to take you. And so for us, some of our challenges, which I haven't even mentioned yet, is some channels have precluded us. The biggest player in pain in Australia is Dulux. Dulux hate us, I don't know why, but they just, someone must have kicked their cat or something in years ago. So do like you don't like us. So you're fine. It's a building cycle. One minute you're celebrating, next minute you're slashing your wrist, right? It's like, my God, a year ago we were so good, now we're dead. So for me, how do I future-proof the business? There's a number of things. One, countercyclical revenue streams in different channels. Two, a, geogra a geographic strategy that takes that risk away. Being, being in channels that are countercyclical means that we're in building in one, maintenance in another, shut down work in another and other. So it's about being able to walk and chew gum, being, developing specialties that will take you there. So to your question about price, I want to keep the pressure on the opposition, but I want to knock them out. 
the tail. I'm a very competitive individual, and if, if they're coming to me struggling, they'll be coming. Okay? So, what I want to do is take their market share and then take their market share overseas. Because for me, the way I want to do it is I want to turn our $30 million business into $150 million and then beyond that. And so for me, it's about conquer Australia, get our position not to shore up, put a moat around our business so we're profitable, but then start putting feelers out. And the only way you can do that is to, have to, to convince yourself and the, and the customers that you're the best product in the market. Try and get scale so you get a reduction in price and volume. Um, and then try and penetrate those markets through whatever means you can. Now luckily for us now, well not luckily but for all the hard work, we're gonna, we're gonna have some investors that are prepared to back it. And so I had a conversation with our new major shareholder only last week, and he was, we were talking about a brand new product. He said, how much capital do you need? Now just so you know, in the last three years I've never had that conversation, we've had no capital. Right? I finally got a chairman that says, how much money do you want to go? What, what do you think the opportunity would be? And I said for argument's sake, I think this could be five million, so I'm gonna need a million to get it started. The five million break to ten, and he said, do it. Didn't even hesitate. I thought, oh, that's a refreshing uh, approach. So for me, this is this is a multi-stage strategy. This is about getting our position right, taking the market share, using volume, and then expanding the market. So that's the question. What would you pay for market share compared to Spiller? Uh, okay, so in, in, in paint products, I think we're probably about 15%. Okay, in scaffolding, we're probably 10. So there's plenty of upside. And so when people say to us, oh, the building industry is hurting us, I say, unless you've got 90% market share, I don't talk to you. Okay. So we, we're in a position where, unfortunately, because of the situation we we're in, and because we were inwardly focused, we've got our, position, our business in a sustainable position at the revenue where we're at. Can we be significantly greater? Absolutely. And the way you do that is to be outwardly looking, to understand how big the market size is. You know, so I always love this conversation with, with, with some of our guys, because we should be maintenance. And they say, boss, we do maintenance. Do you work for people like Spotless or Broad Spectrum or one of those? Do you, oh yes, yes, we do all their work. I said, all their work? And they go, yeah, absolutely. How much work do you do from people like Spotless? Oh, we do 30 grand a month. I said, that's fantastic. Do you know how big Spotless are? Well, I'm not really sure. Their turnovers are like a billion dollars. So you don't do all their work, you go into nothing, none of that. So it's about understanding your market, understanding your customer. I suspect what their answer is, we do all the work for one supervisor, it's quite worse. But there's 400 supervisors. So it's about taking that market share understanding, developing that and saying, how do we scale up? We talked about scalability before, okay? How do we scale up in not one channel, but four channels? I worked for the Bonds business a long time ago. People might know Bonds. Bonds is a clothing brand in Australia. And one of my best teachers was a CEO I worked for at the time, a lady called Sue Morford. Fantastic, you know, brilliant lady. And um, what we did at that time was develop one product and then another and then another and another. We were famous for one product at that time. It was a, the men's singlet, um, it was, you know, a pretty basic product. But what she was a master at was keeping that branch going and then another channel which was women's underwear and then it was girls' t-shirts and then it was men's t-shirts. So we, we developed multi-channel. So my, I'd like to think I'm a genius, but I'm not. I'm just pinching ideas for people I've worked for in the past. But that multi-channel strategy was exactly out of Sue Moffat's copy book. Bonds went from 140 million to 250 million dollars in four years. I want to do the same in our business. But you can apply that logic into any business in terms of how you want to approach it. So that channel strategy for me works because it does a number of things. A, it increases your expertise. B, it allows you to have multiple revenue streams that are counter cyclical and allows you to look at multiple channels that are, are all peaking at a different time. If I can have a business that's peaking at different times and also in different geographies, I'll be running a public company that tries to show some consistent growth. Because if one of them's down, I'll go, you know what, that's terrible, but I've got four other revenue streams. Otherwise, you just find a ditch when it comes down. That was my borrow experience. It's like, okay, let's get rid of half the guys in the yard, let's get rid of half the sales reps. So that's what we're doing now. We're developing that multi-channel thing. But the market share part you ask is a very valid question. Because if you don't know it, how do you know what you're chasing? How do you know what you're chasing? It's really, really important. So I've let the outside in. It might sound like a strange word. You know, I've said to our management team, imagine that you open the window of the office and have all of our shareholders standing in the grandstand looking into this room. What do you think they'd want us to decide? To do the same as before and, and have no growth? I reckon they're sitting in the window waiting for us to make a decision. So when you look at market share, when you look at those other things, what are we going to do differently so that the next year's is off different than this year's is off? 
We don't do that we're letting them down. Their money, not ours. They're, they pay our wages, which is the custodians in this period of time. So we have to know market share, we have to chase it, and we have to try and be very specific about the strategy we do. The mistake of my predecessors is they thought, great, and my market share goal will be to buy a different business, and it blew up, okay? My goal is to take our existing core business and have what, what product adjacencies. So I'm not gonna go out and buy a smelling soft business, it's not what we do. Unfortunately, my predecessors bought businesses like that. They bought really weird product businesses that we had no expertise in. Okay? What I'm talking about is developing the core expertise, then going left and right, left and right, left and right, and then going geography. Okay? You don't, I don't have to become a donut producer. I don't, I've made paintbrushes, not donuts, so I'm not going to buy a donut business. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to become a paint expert around the world. I'm going to become a scaffold business around the world. And then what I'm going to do is buy a root veg protection business. And then I'm going to buy another business that might suit the painting industry. It might buy a uniform business, but they'll be left and right. If you think about some of the best strategies in the world, take Nike, for example, and others, that's exactly what they did. They start with shoes, and then they go tennis rackets, and then they go something else. They go left and right of their core. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're going left and right of our core, and grow across, and then grow geographically. Okay, I think this is when we have to Sure, sure. But then uh, two years ago, three, four years ago, they stopped making all the different. Sure, sure. So, so that, don't forget too, strategies evolve and change, right? So you're right. Nike may have said, you know what, we don't, it may have been an underperforming part of their business, and so they want to feed the strong, not the weak. So they feed the strong divisions, not the weak divisions. Absolutely. I then made a suggestion about them that they want to invest in, in, in whatever they're doing. They just want to invest in the market. So if their product was not doing very well, I mean, it was one of the yeah. three numbers, but not the best. So uh, absolutely. They have time to discuss it. Absolutely. So so in after, after. Your, your analysis is perfect. Um, I want the same. I want to be number one or two. I don't want to be three or four. It's too hard. I want to be number one. Right? Now, number one takes a long time to get there, okay? So, number one for me is where do you start being number one? You can't just start off the market, you're not going to get it. The best place to start, and Mike did the same thing, is you can't start with poor product. If you start with poor product, people are going to work you out in about 10 minutes. So the only place to start for me is great product. Okay? Once you have great product, but then it's great service. There's no, there's no point having great product if people can't get it. So I've said to my warehouse team, in before two, out the same day. They went, you're crazy. I said, no. If a paint, the painters aren't necessarily scientific people, I don't mean to disrespect me if you're a painter, but they want to run out of paintbrushes this afternoon, they want it tomorrow. So we, we developed a service standard, a service standard across the entire business. And so the most simplistic one is exactly that. In before two, out the same day. So we say to our customers, if you place an order before two o'clock, next morning it's on your doorstep. So start with great product, then have great service. You start eliminating the reasons why you can't be number two or number, four, number one, okay? Then it gets harder after that. Then you've got to convince customers to take you. And so for us, some of our challenges, which I haven't even mentioned yet, is some channels have precluded us. The biggest player in pain in Australia is Dulux. Dulux hate us, I don't know why, but they just, someone must have kicked their cat or something years ago. But Dulux don't like us. So fine. Here's another challenge we've got to deal with. The biggest guy who has 50% market, he doesn't want to talk to us. So you know my feeling is, I'll take the customers off. Screw you, Lars. Sorry, take that out of the video. <laughs> <laughs> the truth of the matter is, people will not choose you even if you have the best product. Because they've got their own strategy. So in the world of online, why can't we be the, the best online paper provider in Australia? There's no one's doing it at the moment, and we're about to. The new investors have a whole new view, and we want to make sure that people can get us anywhere they like. And if, and if the storefront doesn't want to use us anymore, that's fine, I don't need a storefront. People come online, we're going to create the best app in the country. If you're a painter on site, we'll find your name and say, oh, I've noticed you're a paint member today. Would you like your paintbrush to deliver there tomorrow morning at 9am? You go, thank you, send. And we'll deliver it to you. So we're developing new technologies to keep the bricks and mortar going but also have new channels to market. So we're not talking about channel strategy, not just channels in the traditional channel sense. It's online channels. It's a whole bunch of stuff at the moment where you can, you can access the market. 
What's happening in our paint industry right now is that all the big fish are eating the smaller ones. So Dulux have just bought a chain called Paint Squad, who are a customer, they don't like us, we're out. There's 15 stores we just lost. Now that's gonna to continue to happen. If you notice in the Australian economy, we're an economy of duopolies. We have four banks. We have only a few insurance companies. We only have a few mining producers. We're a country of duopolies and our industry is no different. How do you break a duopoly? Take the customers off them. Can you take the customers off them? That phone that you're holding in your hand and buying into your life from all over the world. We need to do that. And people have been so scared of it. Oh, I can't go online because I've settled my bricks and mortar customers. If you don't do it, you're dead. So you have to do both. So for us, the channels don't just exist in existing channels. They're channels that we don't even know about yet. And so there's a whole bunch of work that we're doing things called drop shipments and other things that are all electronic that um, we'll, we'll, we'll roll out the next block right anyway. Sorry to take up so much time.